Hey yo, hello, this is a video to describe what's the difference between indicated airspeed and true airspeed. What are what are they? What's indicated airspeed and what is true airspeed and what's the difference and why do pilots need to know and how can it be useful to us? Okay, so basically, I'll just briefly summarize very quickly what they are. Beginning with indicated airspeed, as it is, indicated is the airspeed that is indicated. Oops, is the airspeed that is indicated. How exactly is it indicated? Well, you can pilots can see it from their airspeed indicator, right? Which is what you'll see in the cockpit. What is actually being indicated in the airspeed indicator? If you guys check your textbooks, right? It's the, you got two ports connecting. You got your pedo port. That's a very weird pedo port. All right, that's something like that. And then you've got your static port. You, got, you know, your pedo static system. The static port is being fed by the static pressure of the, of the atmosphere that the aircraft is currently in, whether it be mean sea level or 2000 feet. Every altitude has a different atmosphere, and that different pressure in that atmosphere will be will be fed into this static port. Now, on the right, you have your pitot tube, which actually is faced in such a way that you will get the ram air pressure. That's ram, as in I ram into something. Ram air pressure. This ram air pressure is being fed into the pitot tube, and the static port also is feeding the static pressure. So how does the airspeed indicator work? It basically subtracts the static port, so static pressure, sub it subtracts the, the, the ram air pressure, let's put it RAP, from the static pressure to get your dynamic pressure. What on earth is dynamic pressure? <laughs> okay, one easy way to think of indicated airspeed uh, is it's the impact speed. Okay, think about it as the impact speed if you can't help it. The impact speed of what? The impact speed of the air molecules relative to the aircraft the air, or the amount of air molecules impacting the aircraft. The speed of the molecules impacting the aircraft. So, therefore, you can see that indicated airspeed actually doesn't measure speed. It actually is measuring the dynamic pressure. And when there's a higher, when the aircraft is moving faster, it has a higher ram air pressure. When there's a higher ram air pressure, the difference will be greater. And that difference is your dynamic pressure, which then will translate into your indicated airspeed. Right? So I like the word uh, impact speed. So impact speed, can you imagine this is a drawing, right, of an uh, aircraft? And these blue things are air, are air molecules. Okay, not water vapor, air, okay, whatever, whatever. Air molecules, right? So let's say you're flying at mean sea level, okay? QNH, you know, for example, 1013 or something. Okay, the impact, the indicated airspeed is the impact speed of these air molecules onto the aircraft. As the aircraft's flying, right? It's hitting all these molecules. The speed at which these, the aircraft or the molecules are hitting each other is the impact speed, which translates to the pressure difference, which translates to your indicated airspeed. That's basically it. Okay, but that's in mean sea level. But as you go higher, right? At a higher altitude, let's say 10,000 feet, okay, temperature is maybe dropped by maybe five to 10 degrees or more. The pressure is lower, it's less dense. So you can imagine there's a lot less air molecules now in the air as compared to before, right? Because it's, it's just logical, it's flying higher altitude. So what happens is in order to get the same, for example, indicated airspeed, in order to get the same amount of dynamic pressure, the aircraft actually has to fly it faster because there's less air molecules in the air. So to get the same impact speed, the aircraft has to fly faster. And that's why at high altitudes, or at even it's not so high altitudes, maybe 5,000 feet, there's already going to be a difference between your indicated airspeed, which is the speed of the impact of the air molecules to your aircraft, and the speed you're actually flying relative to the air. Right? There's a difference now because now there's less air molecules in the air to impact, right? So that's basically it. So now that's true airspeed. True airspeed is basically the speed relative, speed of the aircraft relative to the air, right? That's, the, that's for example, uh, you can think about it as the speed you're going past the clouds, relative to the clouds, because the clouds are basically huge masses of water vapor it's sitting in the air, right? Without taking wind into account yet. Yeah, this is just what true airspeed is. It's the speed of the aircraft relative to the air or the mass of air. Okay, one example we taught in the, I taught in the class last week is okay. Imagine a travelator. Okay, a travelator. What you see in like is basically a, a flat escalator, but it's not. You're not escalating. You're just going in one direction, right? So let's say this travelator is not moving. It's at zero meters per second. It's stationary. 
But me, I'm here and I'm walking on the travelator to the right at 1 meters per second. That's my speed. Okay? So since we define the true airspeed as the speed of the aircraft relative to the air, that's basically the speed that I'm walking relative to the stationary travelator. That 1 meters per second. Therefore, my true airspeed is 1 meters per second. Make sense? Because that's the speed that I'm walking relative to the travelator. The mass of air, in, in this case, the speed of the aircraft relative to the mass of air. And let's say you have an, a third observer. This guy over here with the eye. See? He's just looking at him from, from, from somewhere that's not the travelator. He's looking at me. What's the speed that he's moving? Well, relative to, the, relative to everywhere else, the ground, I'm still moving at 1 meters per second. That translates, and that is how you get ground speed. Because it's the speed you are relative to the ground now. Previously, true airspeed is relative to the air. But now, as a third observer, which is the ground, you're relative to the ground. It's a different reference point. But now, if the travelator is moving now, if the travelator is moving in this direction, right? This direction, opposite direction, at one meter per second. What I'm saying is the whole travelator itself, including me, is moving at one meter per second, the opposite direction. So what is my true airspeed? Well, if the reference point is the travelator, right? If the reference point is the travelator, I'm still moving at one meters per second true airspeed, right? Because the travelator is not moving relative to the travelator to me, right? You could be stopped, you could, you could not move on the travelator. The travelator itself is moving relative to the ground, but I myself is not moving. So here in this case, the true airspeed is still one meters per second. But now, relative to this guy who's observing from the side, basically it cancels out, right? This two cancels out. So the ground speed is zero because the reference point is the ground. And if you're not standing on the travelator, you're not moving at all. But if you're on the travelator, you're still walking. The travelator is moving in the opposite direction. That's this movement of the travelator is the wind. If it's against you, it's your headwind. In this case, it's like a headwind. If it's in the opposite direction, it's a tailwind. Right? It's a tailwind. And if it's moving, let's say if the travelator itself is moving at 1 meters per second, that means to the ground's perspective, you are moving at 2 meters per second. So that's ground speed. And that's why, you used, that's why we use true airspeed uh, in navigation, because with true airspeed, you just need to count in the wind and you'll get your ground speed. And then distance over speed times time, you can calculate how, uh, how, how long it will take at a certain speed to get to your different waypoints. So that's basically it. But I wanted to share one more cool thing. Okay, there's a there's an important relationship how you get indicated how do you get true airspeed from indicated airspeed. Okay, this is all done behind the scenes in the in the cockpit or in the in your different instrumentations. What acronym I can remember or you can remember is iced tea is a pretty cool drink, right? Iced tea. That's in the Charlie Echo Tango, iced tea. Papa Charlie Delta. Okay, indicated airspeed. Okay, okay. From indicated airspeed, it's relative to your the the mean sea level, correct? Mean sea level. There are certain factors and errors that haven't been accounted for yet. For example, the position. That's what P stands for. The position of the pitot tube on the aircraft. You also have in some instrumentation errors that are factored in. They're very small errors, but they 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 are they are there. They exist and they do affect the actual uh, true airspeed. So, after you factor in the position and instrumentation error, you will get CAS. CAS is your calibrated airspeed. Normally in your pilot operating handbook, you'll see a table somewhere and you'll have a graph uh, very nicely indicating what is the relative CAS to your IAS. That's already given to you in your handbooks, pilot handbooks or the aircraft specific flying handbook. Now, one more thing that has not been considered because technically, oh, I, I should be already okay. Why do I have, still have more things to cover? More errors? Are there more errors? Yes. When, for example, uh, if you remember in aerodynamics, when you're flying uh, slower than Mach 0.33, or let's just give a number. Let's say if you're flying anywhere below 200 knots, right? Below. Air can be considered incompressible, right? You can consider it incompressible. But at higher speeds, air starts to compress, and the compressibility has an error. For example, in the pitot tube, at a higher speed, the air, the ram air going in, starts to compress, starts to compress as it goes in, and there's an error there. So 
after you cut you factor in the compressibility which is what c stands for you will get your eas which is your equivalent equivalent airspeed equivalent airspeed pilots don't really need to know the equivalent airspeed has more to do with the aircraft design and something that engineers will need to know but as a pilot you don't need to know that so you can just completely ignore that but good to know what in uh, the different uh, air speeds are especially what equivalent airspeed is lastly the most important factor is the higher you go the less air molecules they are the less dense it is that's what d stands for density after you factor in the density you will get your true airspeed which is how fast you're moving how fast you the aircraft is moving relative to the mass of air around it and if the whole mass of air itself is moving that's wind right that's wind and then after you factor in your wind you get your ground speed right does that make sense okay i hope that makes sense